All right, guys. Well, hey, we are back from our uh, short little break there here at Note Camp 5.0. We are excited here for the afternoon, kicking off with our good buddy. Join That's us right. all the way from Mississippi, our buddy, the IRA dealmaker, Mr. Walter Wolford, man. So you bring in some love from the Love Shack for everybody? Well, I hadn't been out there in a week or so, but it's that's because it's being rented through Airbnb. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Well, hey, we're glad to have you for the first time on Note Camp, Walter. So Well, hey. thank you, Scott. And you were you added such a a, a great experience level when you came on uh, the cruise recently. So I appreciate you participating in what we do. Yeah. Hey, hopefully you talk a little about what's up with the FFN network here in your slides. Did you get, you have a slide for that? Yeah, probably not, but we'll talk about it. All right. we'll, well, we that. hadn't, we're booking, well, I'll tell you right now, we're booking one for May of 2019 will be the next one. Okay. And, uh, and we hadn't finalized it yet, but we're going to Cuba. Ooh, that will be fun. That will be fun. All right. You ready? Yes, sir. We're ready. All right. So I went to the corner bakery this morning and spent about three hours on this presentation. So you'll help me pick all the uh, typos out, right? <laughs> We're good. That's the middle thing. You don't have to be a good typo or good penmanship to be a real estate investor. <laughs> no. You need to be a good negotiator, though. Yes. All right. So you guys know I'm not giving any tax legal financing advice. I'm, I'm just telling you what I do in our little community in Jackson, Mississippi, which is the state capital. And that's the only place that I do business. So it's right here. And I'll tell you more about what we do. Uh, today's topic, though, is about joint venture IRA investing for real estate and notes. But I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a little philosophical on you, Scott. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really about a way of life of joint venturing. And so let me just give you a little background. Enough about you. Let me tell you about me, right? <laughs> um, I'm old. I've been doing real estate for 36 years in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm living about a half a mile from where I went to college and a half a mile. I've lived in this neighborhood called Bellhaven most of my adult life. So we know people here. We can't walk down the street without knowing people. And I like that. I really like that. Uh, married for 42 years, coming up this June, and got three kids, great kids. Two of them are married, and the two, two boys are in real estate here in town. They are, they got their own operation, and we do different things. I'm, I'm more in the affordable housing space. They do management, each of them, and brokerage. And so we have, you can imagine what we talk about around the dining room table, right? Exactly. Uh, we, uh, we, we often have a power, family business power breakfasts, and we hold each other accountable and know, we know what each other's doing. So that's, that's pretty good. And to know, know what the business is, uh, the family business, kind of like the Godfather, right? Yeah, that's the truth. Yes. Once All right. So, in, let you out. Yeah. All right. So I want you, I'm going to ask you philosophically. So I'm, I'm putting you on the spigot. Okay. Would you rather have all of the deal or a piece of the deal? You know, I personally, for me, I'd rather have a piece of the deal instead of all the deal sometimes, because I'm a big believer that I can leverage my funds better if I get a piece of it, or if I'm leveraging my time to get a, a lot more pieces of multiple pies versus just one pie. Well, and I'm the same way. Uh, you know, I realize that real estate's a team sport. And of course, you know that too. And uh, I've, I've done all the carrying the weight of debt and changes in the market on my shoulders. I don't want to carry those anymore. Mm. Uh, so th that's, this is kind of a mindset for you. I started out in the wholesale business, letting somebody put the money up. Uh, I'd close on it and then sell it and would split. They'd get their money back, we split the profits. And that's how I started 36 years ago. And I still think it's a good model. It's hard to go broke that way. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> so let's talk about this. So I, uh, I always start my talks with uh, Wikipedia. I want to know what they got to say about whatever I'm talking about. And so a joint venture. Now, let's see. I can't even read, read that top line because I can't even read it because I'm covered up with the screen. Joint venture is a business entity created by two or more parties, generally characterized by shared ownership shared returns and risk and shared governance. Now that's a pretty good definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Companies typically pursue joint ventures to gain scale efficiencies by combining assets and operations to share the risk, that's what I'm talking about, or to access skills and capabilities. All right, so that's what the topic of this is, joint venture IRA investing. So I went to Mr. Wikipedia and I say, well, what do they say about IRA investing? And the page IRA investing does not exist. <laughs> well, maybe we need to wake Wikipedia up. But I'll tell you who does know about this is GoDaddy. Wow. <laughs> who wants to buy that domain? It's available for, <laughs> for only 15 All right. So going back to that definition, to gain scale efficiencies by combining assets and operations to share risk or to access skills and capabilities. And I'd add one more thing. To net it out, one party brings the opportunity to another, and they may not need each other, but it's harder to go broke joint venture. You can do the deal by yourself. Easier to go broke that way. Mm -hmm. So sharing, sharing, well, you're just sharing upside and you're sharing downside. And I've just, this gray hair that I have, I earned it by not realizing that it's better to share both the up and the down. And so we're going to talk about that with IRAs too. So here's another question for you. Would you rather be a deal provider or a deal funder? You know, there's times I'm both actually. I would probably be rather be a deal provider because um, then I'm got plenty of people out there that can fund the deals. I mean, I we fund enough deals now, but initially getting started, I had to be a deal provider because I didn't have the funds. Well, so we we do wear both hats, but which do you think you can leverage more, being a deal provider or a deal funder? A deal provider. I don't think so. You don't think so? I think you can get your fingers in a lot more pieces and pies if you if you're on the money side of the transaction okay. so that's just it, Philosoph there's not philosophically it's great that's a, there's no right or wrong to that aspect of things i don't think all right so which one is more important the funding uh -huh. got to have the funder exactly uh -huh. all right so i you've seen this slide before scott uh, I, I like putting it up there because the most valuable line item on your personal balance sheet isn't written down and you know that. I mean, you're a master at this networking piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're everywhere. <laughs> you can, I can't go kind of turn on my computer without having you looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't realize you're partially to blame for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the network is, um, is very valuable. And it takes time to create a network. And it one-on-one, -on -one, FaceTime sitting around, traveling together, drinking together, and finding out what somebody else needs and be a provider of some type. So I, I, I've made two offers today, so I'm a, I'm a deal provider, but I think I'd rather control it from the money standpoint. That's just me. All right, so joint venturing is a way of life and business. Limiting your downside while increasing your upside. Kind of think of it as, Options. You like dealing with options better than ownership? Yeah. I do. I don't know. It varies. It depends on the deal. I like the option. If I can't guarantee ownership, the option usually entitles me to the ownership later on. And it has to do with your market and what you think about the future. Amen to right? that. Amen By to the that. way, as just a sidebar, Netflix has got a documentary on Donald Trump at the real estate Donald Trump. It's going back to uh, starting when he was age 27 making deals with the city of New York for that first Commodore hotel they bought. I highly recommend it. It's, it's awesome <laughs> from a real estate standpoint. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me just give you a, a philosophical, uh, how it becomes uh, a way of life for me. So Joseph, we had an event here a couple of weeks ago in Jackson. That's in my backyard. And I hired this musician who's also a real estate investor. And so I said, all right, Joseph, he, how much are you going to charge? He said, two fifty for the night. That's the right number. But I said, uh, let me see if I can do a joint venture with you. So when you get through playing, your time's up, call me up there. And so I said, look, Joseph, if I can get you more money, will you play longer? Okay. So you can, and I'm going to call people up and put tips in the jar 
and then you get to keep whatever it is. So you see how I'm limited my downside of having to write that $250 bill, but he gets the upside by playing along. That's so you joint, you do joint ventures every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. And so he got way more money than $250 because he, he got the women up there dancing. So that's just a, a philosophical thing. All right. So look at the, what does it say? I can't read that. Look at the, what? A recent deal, a oh, recent deal. Okay. So here's one that we did and it, it, it turned out well. So I'm not going to tell you about all the things that didn't turn out well. That wouldn't serve a purpose right now, but they don't always turn out, but this one did. So you got the deal provider and the deal funder. So the parties, there's always more parties to executing a deal than just those two. You, got, you probably have another 10 or 15 people involved to make it happen. Well, the closing attorney, insurance agent, all that stuff. Yep. And then you got to have the documents to... Uh, make sure there's an understanding between the parties and am among the two primary. So I got the call from one of my local allies who's actually a closing attorney. And he said, by the way, I got the call while I was on the, the cruise in September to Seattle. And basically he said, look, um, Matter of fact, I got the call sitting at the bar with Quincy, and that's my wife, and that's his wife. So that's real time, real deal. Uh, it happened. So I pulled off my phone and I showed him a contract that I'd negotiated while we we're out to sea. And it was this house. It was in a, a nice area of Northeast Jackson. Uh, it was a five bedroom, three bath house that needed about forty thousand dollars of work. Uh, and it was assessed. Look at the uh, look at what it's assessed for on the right. About one hundred sixty thousand, right? Yeah. Now the, it had a pool that I was afraid to pull the tarp off of it. I, this I didn't look. I didn't want this house. I just wanted the money. You got it. So <laughs> yeah, I like to tell the story about the sardines. So you've probably heard it, but I'm going to tell it again because it's a good example. A guy buys a box of sardines for a dollar sells it to the next guy for two, the next one sells it to the next guy for three, then another one buys it for four, number five. So he, he looks at that $5 box of sardines and said, man, those must be good. So he opened them up, started eating it and spit it out. And he went back to the guy that sold him the sardines. He said, why'd you sell me these rotten sardines? He said, no, 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 buddy, you got it all wrong. Those were trading sardines, not eating sardines. <laughs> All right, this house, what do you think? Was it eating sardine or trading sardine? Mm. The trading sardine. Uh, yeah, definitely trade with that much in uh, stuff that you need to get done. And, and if you know what the pool looked like, yeah. So uh, I knew that I didn't want to own this for very long. So I, I showed the contract to uh, Quincy while he was sitting across the bar. And you could see his greed glands just getting bigger and bigger. His neck swelled up and it chokes off your blood to the brain. <laughs> But uh, so what we did is we made a deal. I said, all right, uh, you put up 50, I'll put up five, and we bought it for 55. We actually closed on it. We had to have $2 to remove the freak, you know, trim it up, get all the junk out of the house, that sort of thing, so we could decide what to do. So this is a, this is a classic joint venture. In it. Somebody provides a deal. Somebody provides most of the money. And then, uh, so it looks something like this. You got to come up with multiple exit plans when you do so. Purchase it for 55, freak removal 2000, list it for 99. All right, so we had, we have, we've got three hedge funds buying in town and they don't mind tackling this. And they actually bought it as a rental. Now, to me, that doesn't fit my rental mod, but they think if they can rent it for 1750 a month, maybe they can. Well, so there's so my son, who's uh, an agent, listed it. I said, we cleaned it out, 99. And uh, within a week, we had a hedge fund offered 92 and we accepted it. So if they had not have done that, then we would have bought it for 55 and total rehab and list it for 159. And that's that would have worked, too. So I had two ways I could go on that. And we went, often when you're entering into a joint venture, most of the time you don't know how it's going to end because market conditions dictate. 
you know, I've, I got a uh, home inspection and I knew what they thought was wrong with the house, but there's always more wrong to a house, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so we, this is how we do it virtually every transaction. We're going to take title in a trust. I'm a big believer in the trust. And so it was owned by the two parties, 50-50. But that doesn't reflect what the deal is. And the deal is, that's just the ownership, right? So we had to have a separate agreement. We had to have a joint venture agreement. And so it basically said the contributors get the first money back. I got five, he got 50, and then we split 50-50 profit. That's a classic joint venture structure. But adding the trust gave us some flexibilities. And then we had to, we had to spell out who gets the money and, and anticipate what happens you know, there might be a capital call if we got to fix it up. You, we just didn't know. But we sold it, oh, I guess within 30 days it closed. So that's a pretty good, pretty good way to do it. So it's an example of a, a JV for a trust owned by IRAs. They were both, those were both tax-free. Let me go back. Maybe I didn't say that. Yeah, Walter IRA and Quincy Qualified Plan. So in that sale, is that a taxable? event is if they're owned by IRAs, is it a taxable event? No, no. All right. So it worked out just fine. Of course, what you got to do when you got somebody's money and profit, you got to roll it into the next deal. You can't give it back to them, right? They got to find another deal. And that's what we did too. But this is an example of a JV for a trust owned by IRAs. All right. And for real estate. So what about a JV owned a trust that owns a note or option. This might be a similar type of trust that we use, but, but I like using trust for owning notes, options, and lending. Different type, different kind of trust, but similar parties. So I got the call from a, a, a tired landlord and he says, look, the, the tenant has been there six years. They've been paying 450 a month. It's a two bedroom. And I want to sell that house to you and then you finance it to the tenant. And now he didn't want to finance it for the tenant because he didn't know how to do it. He just had one exit. I'm, I'm picking up somebody breathing heavy in, the, in that. Can you hear him on your end? No, uh, there's only a Maybe it's just me. I'll, I'll mute myself to like comment. Well, Okay, just just us. Okay, maybe that mic was too close. I guess when you lean back, that's probably what happened. Anyway, um, so I looked at the house and I talked to the tenant, and we took them through the qualification for Dodd Frank, and uh, she qualified in every way. So what we what we decided is we'll do this deal, and so it looks like this. So the opportunity is purchased from tan tired landlord for eighteen. And the tenant wants to buy with financing 28 with one down and 72 payments. And they, that equals all in is 450. And that's at an 8% note. Now that's, that's affordable housing. Isn't it? So in 72 payments, she won't have any more. And very likely this lady would, would uh, never own a house if it wasn't for something like that. So, all right, so how would I joint venture on this deal? Let's just have the let's have the presumption that I want to use somebody else's money for every deal. Now that's not always true, but let's say that is. How would you structure that as a joint venture? Well, pretty similar to the, how you structured the last one. Have the investor come in, fund the deal. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit extra for repairs, things like that, and then, then do the same thing. They get their money back and then split the profits either fifty fifty or however. You want to do the percentage on either uh, the payment stream, right? Or on uh, or or uh, an option to be paid off early. Okay, so any it's a blank slate. We can do it any way that you and I can agree to do it. So let's just so we'll put an IRA buying it from the tired landlord in trust. So the IRA will fund the trust and the trust will take title. And later on, it could be six months, a year, somewhere 
uh, if you have a questionable homeowner or one that hadn't proven themselves, rent it to them for a year or two and then sell it on those terms. So it doesn't have to be an immediate sale because the income would be the same, wouldn't it? It's exactly the same. So the IRA buys it in trust and then somewhere down the road sells it to the homeowner with seller financing. So after the sale transaction is complete, you sell a percentage of the trust that owns 100% of the note. So let's say, Scott, it was your IRA that, that uh, put the money up. Well, let, uh, listen, let me do it another way. It's my IRA puts the money up. And so I've got a return on my money. Then we sell it to the homeowner carrying back a note, but the trust converted an asset of real estate owning real estate to owning a note. The trust didn't change, the asset changed. And you'll get, you can go to the Quest site and see that all the time. That's a very common thing to convert an asset. All right, so now if I wanted to get my money back, then I could sell a percentage of the trust, right? Percentage of the trust that owns 100% of the note. That's well, correct. would this work? I could sell for 18,000, just divide 18 into 27. You remember the 27 was the note. And so I could sell 66.67% of the trust for 18,000 that owns 100% of the note. Could that work? All right, so that's a joint venture type arrangement. And I'm happy getting a third of the payments because all of my profit was created. Now, if it'll work for a small deal like that, you think it'll work for a bigger deal? Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, this is, these two deals are just, these are the deals of the week. So I always pull some fresh stuff. So what would, that, what would the parties receive? At, so you'd have an assignment of a beneficial interest in the trust. And let's say that I bought it in my IRA, then I'm gonna sell you two thirds. So you would receive an assignment of the trust, ownership of the trust. But the income then will come in and be split out two thirds, one third. So you say, well, a third of $27,000 isn't much, but just add a zero to it and put it in your market. And it is much, and it's all tax-free. All right, so let, let me pull up another slide. You know this term. Have you run across this term? Alexa heard it, and she's talking to me in there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know this? She thought I was talking to her. All right. Maybe I need to find out what Alexa knows. Impact investor. This um, in impact investing refers to investments made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial, social, or environmental impact alongside a financial return. And you see these, you know, this company's green or they're doing this and it's solar and all that stuff. So it's, it's talking about the investments that you can measure the, the, the effect of this investment. So, well, think about this. Uh, oh, man, there's so many. Bill Gates, uh, you got Sir Richard Branson's got a worldwide impact investing uh, I mean, a lot of people that have wealth want to do good and make a return. So the impact investors active, actively seek to place capital in businesses or nonprofits with the funds in industries such as renewable energy, basic services, including housing, healthcare, education, microfinance, and this, that might be microfinance that we were doing there, and sustainable agriculture. So what we do in Jackson, is uh, we joint venture with retirement account owners to create tax-free notes for cash flow as an impact investor with affordable housing in Jackson only. Now we got a lot of sur suburbs that I don't want to do this in because they don't need my help. I think I wanted to give back something to the community, real estate community, and I'm dealing with C and B minus neighborhoods. You got it? And so it's easy to buy a tenanted house that might be 
tenant might be paying eight hundred dollars. And I in our market, I'm thinking about a specific one that I bought a week or so ago that I bought it for twenty seven thousand dollars. And so I would go to the uh, tenant and say, how would you like to own this? And so I can make your payments two hundred dollars less than what you're paying right now. And you can own the house. You, we require down payment and the Dodd-Frank compliance and all that. But you see what it's doing? It's making an impact because I think home ownership, rather than rental, uh, rent renters does more for the community, and I think it will be measurable. So I'm working. I totally agree with that. You will always have somebody who has a better pride of ownership because they actually own the property versus the rental aspect. I think we're seeing a lot of that in Memphis where it's 85% rental community and they're having blight across the whole city, almost on a block by block places because it is such a big rental market versus owner market. So how do you, how would you change that? Say, unless you go proactively after this, you're not going to change it. The only way to change it is on on an asset by asset basis, getting people to start like you're doing, going out and maybe changing it from a rental mindset. And Hey, we'll offer financing for it. We'll give you a hand up. Uh, we see a lot of that going on in the neighborhoods of Chicago, especially the rougher ends where the, all the gangs have been taking over. The community is regentrifying and they're fighting back neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, house by house in a lot of cases. All right. So it starts with some leadership or, or visions, but, but implementing it, I can't in my remaining career life make the impact by myself. I need a team. I need to sell the dream to somebody else. And of course, we can make some money doing it too. I changed my, uh, I used to call myself an accidental do-gooder. And that was true, but it doesn't sell like an impact investor. It's just the same thing. And so it, so IRAs, I, I use exclusively IRA money. It's just easier to deal with because you, you can, the, the nonprofit status of IRAs non-taxable. So let me just give you a couple that we do. Um, so our price range in the affordable house band is anywhere from 20 to 65. Now, there are no institutional lenders that will make a loan in these neighborhoods less than $50,000. They're sure not going to make a $20,000. Why? Because Dodd-Frank took away the financial incentives for the companies the mortgage brokers, they can't make any money. You agree with that? All right. So if I'm going to sell a house for 20, that means I got to buy it for about 10, 10 or 12. If I'm going to sell that 65,000 that I got, I, I don't need to have more than 40 in it. But all right. So I'm asking you, Scott, which one, which end of the spectrum would you rather play in? Mm, wow. Well, the 20K market, you can have a lot of people that can bring cash to the table to finance you off there. They're not, like you said, banks are going to do a finance on that aspect. But the 65K gives you a lot of flexibility if you're buying it cheap enough that you can carry financing, get some down payment on that aspect and owner finance it in a variety of different ways. I I, I actually like the lower side. Uh, I'm not a big fan of anything over really 100, 150 for the most part, because I like the options and the, the ROI for the lower balance stuff. All right, so if you had to take them back, which would you rather have? Hmm. I, I'd rather have something in the 60 range or less for the most part. It's just so much easier to move, so much easier to move. And so um, one, one of uh, my advisors said, if you're going to play in that band, go for the higher ones. Go for more down payment because you're sure the 20s do improve the neighborhood, but the 65 is a safer place to be. Hmm. Yeah, because you've got to replace the air conditioning, it's less percentage of the house than 25% of the total profit on a $20,000 asset. Exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. So, what? uh, So, I woke up about six months ago, and you may have heard me say this before, but you know, I have a lean organization. Not that I'm lean, my organization's lean, and I try to, um, to build processes, and it's a very hard thing to do for me. And so I got, I got tired of answering the phone. My phone has rung four times in the last five minutes, maybe the same person. I don't know. I hadn't looked at it, but I'm just a small operator. And so to put systems in place is critical for me, critical. And so that's our sign right there. That, that sign, it's a good looking sign. And 
I drive them to the site. Do you see where the phone number is? There's no phone number on it. No, you control how they communicate with you. And so uh, when they go to Improving Jackson, I invite everybody to do that. I took the time, matter of fact, I was wearing this shirt <laughs> to, um, to tell people how they can be qualified so they can, if they, if they know they can't qual be qualified, it doesn't waste my time. So I asked, both of my sons are property managers, and I asked, how much of your staff's time is wasted showing uh, prospective homeowners or tenants houses that don't qualify? And the immediate answer was 90% of my staff's time. And I don't, I don't have that staff. I can't do that. So if they can't follow directions, they're not going to get a house from. Them. And so they go there. And what that is, it's a video. It tells them what to do. And we use Podio to process it and, and virtual assistants and like, like that. But we got to get them. We don't show them houses. We're selling on the, the dream of home ownership, not a particular house. So I want to see your houses. I'm sorry, you can't see my houses. It's, I, I don't have time to go show your house unless you get qualified. Well, how do I get qualified? Go watch a video. I'll tell you exactly. You mean I got to watch a 20 minute video? Only if you want a house. But it's pretty good. It's a mindset thing, and it works. We get, we get, we we are we're right now selling one house a week to homeowners, and we get one application a day. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Thirty. It's thirty a month. Four houses, five houses a week. That's definitely. No, keep no, you busy. no. My volume. I don't want to do five houses a week. I want to do one a week. But I, what I want to show you how you can come in my market and do one. That, say that's leverage, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, you know, I'm going to figure out a way to get, if you come to town, you know, I'm going to figure a way to get my hand in your pocket, right? <laughs> Hang on. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> now I'll sell you something or I can do some service provided, but as long as it's going down this mission-minded road, if you're coming here to buy rental property, I'm, I'm not going to sell you. Now that's that's stupid. I know that's stupid, but that's not part of the part of what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get more rentals. I'm trying to get less rental in uh, in three specific zip codes. So I'm not working all over town. I've, I've picked the ones that have the highest percentage of renters, and they uh, in Mississippi the statewide percentage per zip code is about third a third are renters. In these neighborhoods, they're as high as two thirds. So I'm not going to the to neighborhoods that don't need it. So I'm being very deliberate about that. So here's a, just to kind of give you an example. This is a three bedroom, two bath with central air and heat, and their payment is six fifty eight. That's all in taxes, insurance. Nice house. We bought that from an estate. I paid thirty four for it and sold it for sixty five, something like that. Spent about a thousand dollars on it. But see, that's that was a homeowner that was in there. That house, that particular house would rent for a thousand a month. So you ask the question, why would you give up the cash flow? Renting it for a thousand, because I'm telling you, I'm gonna make more money doing this than you will rent the house if the market doesn't, if it stays stable. Now I, you could make a case that if it's an increasing market, it's better to own it. But in my, so I'm 64 almost. And what I wanted to do is build these monthly income streams tax free to take me and my wife out the remainder of my life. And I hope that the income stream will last longer than we do. That's the goal. Well, if you're doing, think about doing one a week and creating basically ended up with a third of the note. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good cash flow. And so we do them in, in retirement accounts. There's not even any reporting the sale. You don't have a place to report to sale. So here's another one that was really interesting. So that house was uh, on the market. A realtor had listed uh, for 80 and it was an estate property. And so the only thing the realtor knew how to do was just keep lowering the price. So they lowered it to 60, no action. So two years trying to sell this house lowered it lowered it. so I went and made an offer cash offer 20 and they accepted it all right so then I had um 
I had somebody ready to move in. We didn't spend not one dime on that house, did not do one repair and sold it for 43.5. That's what I'm talking about improving the community. And the, the, the guy that was living there was actually medically disabled. He was in a car wreck and he has a job, but he's also medically disabled. And so I called him up one day and when I said, look, if you own the house in Mississippi, you don't pay property taxes if you're medically disabled. So they get checks, they get enough check that they don't have to work, but he chooses to work and they're taking them off the tax roll. Now you may say, well, that's counterproductive to the government structure, but that's the that's laws of Mississippi. So whenever I see somebody that's, I, I can't tell when somebody's medically disabled. I, I mean, the obvious you can, but not always. So here's a two bedroom, two bath house, a 528 payment, nice house. We didn't do anything in that house either. And they were over 65 when they bought it. So that's also a triggering event to get off the tax rolls here. I mean, in terms of paying for the taxes. So like that, also, or, they, or in other states, it's a homestead exemption or things like that too, right? Right. So they got to let, own it and live in it. And they were over 65. So I sold that a couple of years ago. And the husband died. And so she's there. She has an affordable house that can take her out the remainder of her life. That she would not, because that 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 would that's an eight hundred dollar room probably seven fifty. But look at look how it locks her payment, five twenty eight. Here's another one. We actually look, look at guy on the roof putting up the Christmas lights when he took that. But uh, that was a fifteen hundred square foot house we bought straight off the MLS. It was a VA foreclosure for seventeen thousand, and we put we fixed it up. Uh, spent about ten or twelve on it. And then we sold it for, I think, um, 58, something like that. But we provided financing. And, and what's interesting about that house is the owner of that house approached me and said, look, I'm a painter. I want to come to work for you. I said, fine. So what I intentionally do is the, my borrowers and their family members, I want to work them. He's, he's painting a house for me right now today. And so it doesn't make sense that I'm creating a micro economy for uh, the borrowers and their family members. So I kind of interview, find out what skills they got in the area that I'm interested in. See how that builds up the community. And so I said, well, you, you got somebody else that needs a job painting. We got some more jobs. Can you train them? Can, do you know how to train somebody? Yeah, I can train somebody. So we're, we're creating a, a craft oriented situation so here's another one so we bought that from a wholesaler for 24 as a three bedroom two bath house and um the tenants that were in there were paying uh eight fifteen a month and so whenever we go do a repair on the house my repair guys are trained to peck on them and say you know walter will finance this house for you so i got my workers doing the sales job so they called me up <clears throat> just for christmas last year so we're ready to buy the house. And uh, you got any down payment? Yeah, we got some down payment. Good. Your payment's going to be six fifty eight. dollars We'll put it on a 15-year, 8% loan. And they own it. And then you never deal with vacancies. You're also not dealing with any of the repairs because now they're the owners. They're the ones making the repairs to the property as well. So I'll make more money doing this than I will renting it. Because mm -hmm. that, that fix-up between tenants... Not good. Not to mention the vandalism. Mm -hmm. So here's one. This is one of the first ones we did. And um, I tell you, it's, it's good to have flexibility. This lady called me off my car signs and said, I want to save my house. And the, the owner of this had been there for many, many years. And her husband died. She had to go move in with her sister in another city. So I went over there and, and I, I said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to sell this house with financing. And I've got a certain box, a certain criteria that works and your house may not work, but I want to tell you what I'm going to do with it. I said, I'm going to find somebody that will give me $3,500 down and I'm going to sell this house for $43,500. Put it on as a short, 
a payment as I can. And, um, and so I'm telling the owner what, I, and I said, I'll, I'll help you do this. If you need help, I'll walk you through it. And I won't even charge anything for it. If you'll do this for the community. And, but we're going to put a homeowner in here and her face just lit up. She says, you know, my neighbor's across the street. That's all we talk about is who's going to buy this house. And are they going to put some renters in there? It's, it's a real concern for the people left behind of renters coming in. And so what does a typical landlord do? They put a HUD tenant in there. That's a loser's game yeah, in terms of ever selling it to them. So, uh, so the, they've been paying uh, almost five years on that note. And they said, look, Walter, we want to we want to move out to the country. I said, fine. If I got a house in the country, I'll sell it to you. But I didn't have a house in the country. So they said, well, will you take the house back? Sure. I typed up a deed, emailed it to them. They got notarized, dropped through the. So I, I, I basically re released them of the debt. And now they're still in the house. But they, until they're ready to go, they're just now they're renters. And I'll I'll turn around and sell that, probably sell that house to to the hedge fund. Now, the reason I would make the exception about a hedge fund is they're really spending money on these houses. Uh, they spend an average of twenty five thousand. So they're improving Jackson, too. But they're doing it for different purposes. Yeah, but they've also got very, very cheap money, too, behind them. That's why and they're paying usually at a little higher price on them because they've got such a cheaper money outbidding the competition, right? Well, that's certainly been my experience, but they're pretty picky about what they buy. You know, if they if there's a vacant house across the street, they're, I mean, an abandoned house, they're not going to buy it. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. So, all right. That's the end of my presentation. Are we done? <laughs> no, we're not done. We got questions. <laughs> I can uh, go on and on and on. You know that. I know that. I know that. You guys, still, we still got uh, some time here, real fast here. So let's got some great questions here from people. Uh, Hunt asked the question: Do you tailor a new joint venture for each agreement, or is there a custom template that you use with predefined terms? Yeah, I would say tailor to the needs. Uh, if it fits the model of what I'm doing with this affordable housing, it's kind of templated, but. Not every not every opportunity is template, mm -hmm. so you got to be able to take advantage of what opportunities come your way. Right, and the negotiations. I mean, there's some things that you can negotiate better on than you can on other things, and just it's. Uh, I think a lot of people we get that with people. Hey, you got JV agreements? Like, ah, my JV agreements are different for each asset a little bit and each investor. So, the best thing you can do is sit down, talk about what you want to do, put it on paper, and then have a, an investor. Or, I mean, a real estate attorney, draw it up for you, then tweak it from that point going forward. So, Hunt also asked a question, why really, is a trust and not an LLC, Walter? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, trust uh, don't give you the asset protection that an LLC does. It protects the owner, but not the asset. The LLCs can, you know, the LLC can still lose it. But I'll I tell you one very good reason I like trust is because nobody understands it. I really like it for that. But so I had a meeting yesterday with a builder here in town and he owns some rental property. And he said, I've heard you talk about these trusts. Tell me why. And so that's the same question. I said, all right, how many properties you got in your one LLC? He said, 20. I said, fine. What happens if you have a judgment against that, your property and the LLC? It attaches to all of them. So trust separate your assets. So you may lose a property, but you're not going to lose them all. And from a, from a uh, taxability standpoint, they're invisible as far as the IRS is concerned. Whoever the beneficiary is, is the tax paying entity. Well, if you got a, an IRA as the tax paying entity, you're probably not paying any taxes. Good point. Great point. Got a couple questions. Are you creating true contract for uh, deeds? On the ones you're financing, are you doing contract for deeds or doing a traditional mortgage? Well, uh, no, it's I'm the it's a seller finance transaction. Title is changing. They're going to get get title. What I I've got a I don't like contract for deeds, and the reason is, can you do can you guarantee that you'll deliver title in twenty years? 
Well, you'll notice all those contract for deeds are very one-sided mm -hmm. in favor of the, the owner. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen too many, say I deal with other people's judgments every single day. And if, if, if I made a deal with you to deliver me a uh, title in 20 years and you had any kind of judgment, it would prevent you from delivering title. And I, I, see it, I see it almost every day, not just IRS, IRS liens, but uh, hospital bills. So I'm not a big fan of them because I don't think we can really predict what the ability to convey good title in 20 years is. That's, I totally agree with that. You have to double, it's like any other type of lien, you gotta make sure you double check what's on the property, what's attached to the investors. Cause we've bought a lot from a Harbor contract for deeds that we take the property back or they're performing, but we still have to make damn sure there's not judgments or other things against them. And Harbor is not the fastest about paying their bills or taxes or other things. So you've got always to double check that. Uh, we just had Alex Godowski with pro title USA on a second ago talking about cleaning stuff up. And that's it. Well, it's that, important they, to check isn't, out. It, uh, isn't it your understanding that a contract for deed is a taxable event? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. Why, why not, if you're going to, if it's taxable, why don't you give them the deed? Mm -hmm. And it depends on the foreclosure laws in your, you know, it takes us four weeks. It costs about a thousand bucks. But I hadn't, I hadn't had to foreclose on too many. I might foreclose on maybe two or three a year, but so far, everyone I foreclosed on, I've made more money when I took yeah. it out. I, I'd agree to that. I mean, that's usually we can do cash for keys to get the borrower to move out of those, you know, the tenants on the on contract for deeds. We don't usually, uh, we look to convert them as well. If they're over, you know, $40,000 in value, we'll go to look to convert them to a traditional note, uh, depending on the foreclosure time frame, of course. If it's in a longer foreclosure state like South Carolina or Florida, it's easier for us to be able to do an eviction than it is a foreclosure you know, a lot cheaper. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, and I uh, agree, they're just not very customary here in Mississippi. Sure. Yeah, we don't see a lot of them there. Uh, Hunt asked, "Did you get an origination license for this model, or do you use yeah, a?" You got to use a mortgage loan originator. You got to do that. And so take them through that, and you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and my understanding is they use the software, and I collect all the information for. Them. So I make their job real easy. Here's everything that you need. Plug it in, and they do this. They do that. They do that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a good, a bad, or a no, and it's all based on a lot of different things. Uh, you're just basically having the borrowers fill out the, their information like it's a traditional uh, loan application or a ten out of three, correct, Walter? Yeah, but uh, I, I hooked them directly up with the mortgage loan originator. I'm not taking an application from them. Cool, cool. Um, Christina asked a question. So, when you sell a portion of the trust in your example, does that give them majority interest or controlling interest in the deal? Yeah, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to oust a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. Like, the, practically the, the, impossible. Mm -hmm. Well, the beautiful thing is you're getting a third off of nothing for the most part. You know, that's an infinite return on investment for you for the most part on these deals. So our average note is principal and interest 450 a month. So I'm getting 150 increase now this is tax-free per week if i'm doing 50 a year now you say well that's not much money well if it goes for 15 years and at the end of the first year you got 50 times 150 dollars it is a lot of money mm -hmm. well that's the thing a lot of people i think are so used to the whole magic flip this you know, you know magic wand investing i'm going to flip it and make 50 grand or 100 grand and because that's what they see on TV. And I'm a big believer that the real estate in the known industry, it's not a get rich quick. It's a get rich business, but it's got to put some business and time into it. And you can definitely, when you do like, I love that example. Hey, 150, $200, $300 every month per deal. That pays your light bill. You start whittling down your expenses to the point where if you've got need five grand to cover all your expenses, you're basically retired after 15 deals. Well, and see what most people that get good at, anything buying and selling they don't slow down long enough to figure out who their partner really is and it's uncle sam mm -hmm. and so we have these 
IRA edu this IRA education that I would bet you, this is just my guess, less than 20% of real estate investors engage the Roth IRA world. What do you think? I would say probably a 5% aspect of things. So, so the pain of paying taxes hadn't gotten great enough for the energy it takes to learn this game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not, maybe, maybe the pain is too high to learn it. I don't know. We start having some negative interest rates. It might get a little bit easier for people to start doing some things differently. It's just that most people though, we live in such a, uh, give it to me now. They don't want to take the time to learn. What can I do now versus taking the time to set things up, taking the time to put some money in place, you know, fund some of these deals initially with a little bit of money and start just making a few changes to how you do the deal to dramatically grow your, your IRA accounts. It's just, it's huge. It's totally huge. All right. So let me, I got an offer. I wasn't going to put this slide up, but, but I'm going to see if, if you object, you can, you can edit out this. Okay. That's my cell phone right there. You see it? That's my email address right there. If those listening to this, uh, if you pull out your phone like this, take a selfie, smile, and text me the picture, your name, and email address, and I'll send you a uh, the webinar series, I think it's eight sessions on trusts for real estate and trusts for IRAs that Quincy helped me do about a year ago. And I'll give you access to it. And uh, if you want to be part of the Financial Friends Network is uh, the network that Quincy and I started about eight years ago, 1500 members. The only way you can get in is to be invited. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cost anything to it, but it allows you to post deals on there, and you get, get to know folks. And so if you'll, again, if you'll pull out your phone, take a picture, text me your picture along with your name and email address, I'll invite you for that. Awesome. And I'll send you the, the webinar. And it, it's a good implementation webinar series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good stuff. Some more questions here. Patty says, are there occasions when you offer preferred rate of return for the investor than the 50-50 split? Like if your IRA investor only wants to make like 8% or 12% of their money versus giving up half the deal? Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. But again, the reason you want other people involved is because you're on their team too. And so I could give them a straight percentage of the deal, but I say, I, let's just keep it simple. Money takes half. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Samuel asked a question, have you ever had to get out of partnership due to disagreements on one of your deals? Yeah, I'm sure that they will, not all of them turn out great. I wouldn't think. Now that one did pretty good because you don't know. <laughs> I like to quote, as investors, we, we have to make instantaneous decisions based on limited information that have consequences. And you, sometimes you can't tell the mold infestation <laughs> in the house and things that cost you a lot more money, or you don't really know about the drug dealing next door neighbor because you hadn't met the neighbor yet. <laughs> so there are things like that that happen. And so uh, that's a reason I like joint venturing because they're taking the downside risk as well as taking the upside risk. And that's fair. That's in my mind, that's fair for both parties. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Sylvia asked a question. You said the sales not tracked on your deals, but if you're doing them under a note and mortgage, isn't that recorded? Yeah, it is recorded. Yeah, but when I said it's uh, the note and deed of trust is recorded. So it's a simple seller financing. The trust is the owner, sells it to the homeowner, and the lender on the note and deed of trust is the name of the trust. Mm -hmm. So sure, I mean, it's, it's recorded. But what I'm talking about is when you do an IRA transaction, an investment, See, the transactions are not reported to your custodian. They're not, they don't want to know what transactions you did other than if you're instructing them to send money, sign this contract. That's how they know. But they don't report that to the IRS, mm -hmm. your IRA transactions. You know, the custodians really just do three reporting. They, they report when you make a contribution, when you take a distribution, and that year-end evaluation. 
they don't report the transactions. Mm -hmm. No, they're in their records, but they don't say, well, he sold a house, he sold a house. Mm -mm. They said, this is how much money is in the account. Exactly. There's not a way to report it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing a lot of states too don't report it. And here in Texas, they don't report the actual number of sales. I mean, we get a form from the county appraisal district asking us to fill it out. And if we're stupid enough to fill out what we paid for it, then they notice they do that. But in a lot of the states, they don't record the sales. So. I, uh, I throw those directly in the trash can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Clark asked a question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks for the the, uh, the, the, the kindling or the, the lighter fluid in your stuff to start with. Clark asked a question. What term do you typically offer uh, as far as number of years, interest rates, and, and do you keep a database of the people that you want to rent to own? Uh, yeah, uh, yes to, I know who, who I want to sell to. And I'm going to come back to that, uh, answer that question, but I've changed over the years, 5%, 9%, but I've settled on what I think is, will attract an impact investor is 8%. So a neighbor's firing up the lawnmower. I think we're going to be done soon. Oh, we're pretty good. I don't even hear it. I actually don't even hear it. So hang on. We got a few more questions here. Um, how are you selling any of your notes on either partials? Okay. Wait, wait, before that, I, I need to go back and answer that question. Do okay. I have, do I have a list of, of potential buyers? See, so I'll take them through this process. They got to qualify themselves and go watch the improvingjackson.com video and you'll see the process. They fill out, they, I take some basic information and tell them, you go gather up all these documents. I want tax returns. I want your W-2. I want pay stubs. I want, if you got any kind of ongoing uh, car notes, I want to see that. So I'm just gathering all the information and setting an appointment to talk with them. Now, one of the things is I tell them, we're going to get a verification of rental history. If you're not paying on your rent on time, you're not qualified because we're not, we're looking for mature people to deal with, not somebody that's gaming the system. And so I'm, it's, it's kind of like the fatherly talk to these folks. If you've got enough discipline to have a down payment saved up and you care enough about your family that you're gonna give them something in the future, then I'm your guy. If you're, if you're a serial stiffer of landlords, and we're gonna check that out through TLO and other, we'll, we'll know that they're that they have a history of that. And I had a lady who came in that looked great on paper and then I pulled a TLO report. She had been evicted five times. That pattern is not gonna change because they own the house. I can't, I can't help that person. And I said, look, you've disqualified yourself. And so I'm looking for that deserving family. I'm not looking for somebody that just raises their hand because I'm marrying them for 15 years. So typically it's, it's no longer than 15 years. I've, I've done some for five years, seven years, eight years. I try to get it paid off as quickly as I can at 8% interest. That's my magic number today. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be going below 8%. Um, I, I would have been a big advocate that if you can get better than 8%, go out and get it. And most people can't go get it with financing. And 8% is still a decent enough rate, somewhere between 8 to 10. If you have to sell that note off after a while to pull capital out too as a note sale, you want to be in an 8 to 10% in interest rate. Anything below that, you're going to take a big discount from you know, uh, FNAC or anybody else as a note buyer for the most part. Well, but think about this. In my model, I'm not selling the note. I know you're not. I'm not just talking about you, my friend. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you one other thing that the underwriters can't do they can't have a belly to belly conversation with somebody and the sniff test. I ask them hard questions. I'm sure you do too. You know, I want to see how they're going to respond to, well, what do you think is going to happen if you don't make your payment? Uh, I don't know. I'll get, I'll get services. I'll get public services. Uh -uh. See, if they answer that way, they're just disqualified. Yep, exactly. Exactly. What does uh, Joe ask? What is the three biggest mistakes that they need to watch out for when doing owner financing. And that's a really good, I would say it's probably one of them, making sure that they, if they, the gut doesn't say it's good, don't go against their gut, right? I look for attitude. Um, I'm, um, I may really cut my audience in half with this statement I'm fixing to make. But the reason I voted for Trump was because I thought he had a better shot at ending entitlements. 
in Mississippi, we got a bunch of entitled people because they're getting government checks. Now, I'm the guy that's going to start getting them in a year, right? But um, I just don't like entitled people. I don't want to deal with them. So if I, if, I, if I get this attitude that you can't tell from an underwriter who's looking at paperwork, I want to see what they, if they're going to take responsibility. And it's, look, I'm wrong a lot. You can't, we're making, we're making decisions with limited information, but I want to stack it in my favor. If I got to get the house back, I'll just go sell it again. I'm not setting them up for failure, but I'm also limiting my downside every, every chance I can. That's the truth. Any other pitfalls you tell people to watch out for besides the attitude and the sense of entitlements that sometimes people have when they're looking for owner financing? Well, uh, if you put some time in there where they rent for a while and then you, you agree to sell or finance at some price and terms in the future, that's some real incentive for that. Let's say it's 12 months. And uh, that's usually enough time for crazy to show crazy. You can't see crazy on the front side. You see crazy after a period of time. Right? I mean, you can't, you can't, you're not, nobody's good enough to see crazy on the front side if they don't want to show it crazy. Mm -hmm. And I met crazy several times. <laughs> uh, question here from Chad is, do you do this business model for others as a service if we were to bring you notes or properties for you? Well, I'd buy the properties. Um, as long as they're in Jackson? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to go anywhere else. That's not part of my mission. Mm -hmm. Is I wanted. Can you hear the lawnmower now? <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to to conquer the world here. I'm just trying to improve my community. Period. My community. Yeah. I'm all in for Jackson. There you go. Um, so, so as a new young, as a young note investor, should I form an IRA to fund my deals through the business? Uh, no, Hunt, I, that's what I, I would ask. Start an IRA to fund your deals. Fun, start an IRA to fund at some point some of the deals, but start putting some of your profits. Use that, uh, start an IRA, start using some of that money in there to put down as option agreements so that you can wholesale, make some quick money back in on your investments and stuff like that. I, to me, as a beginning investor, it's important to learn the IRA game so you can engage other people's money. Mm -hmm. That's way more important. Say, so I've, I've used the total number of IRA tran transactions I've done, probably 80% of them are other people's money. So you gotta learn how to engage other people's money in that tax-free environment. And, it, and it's, it takes a little learning, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, but it's still well worth it. Um, who do you use for a trust or is there one that you would recommend for setting up a trust? No, I, I'm not in the document recommending business. I know that, um, uh, Dykes Botterford puts on a good course. It's assets101.com. I've been to it. He's, he's excellent. Uh, Jack Shea out of Tampa does an excellent job of teaching trust. But really, um, there's enough information out there that if you have the patience to, to learn about trust, it's well worth your time. I think probably it's learning trust. If I had to prioritize the most important thing about real estate investing is keeping what you got. And if you learn how to keep what you got with trust going into it, it's, it's, it's foundational. Mm -hmm. um, what, see, Scott, when you, when you tell the world that you own stuff through the secretary of state, you know, LLC, who owns LLC, you're, you're telling everybody, come get it. That's not true with trust. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Um, do you use this formula involving your personal property trust, Bob asks? Uh, well, personal property trusts are, in my mind, they're the same structure. You got to have a grantor, somebody that sets a trust up, and a beneficiary, usually they're the same. And then you got to have a trustee. So that's true for a land trust and a personal property trust. They, a trust is a trust. It can hold real or personal property, Right. But the 
real estate laws of the state have to do with owning real estate, not personal property. So you literally could use the same document to do to own an option or to own to do lending. There's just a, a distinction between whether it's going to own personal property or whether it's going to own real estate. They're almost identical instruments. Correct. Um, question for Michael is, how small of an IRA investor will you use? I mean, is there a limit to use? Somebody's got five grand or 10 grand. Or I can't do anything with that. Okay. Uh, and I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't want to buy an asset that only costs $5,000. But I, I will make a point, and Quincy's beat me up about this enough. Quincy Long is who I'm talking about. Um, small dollar IRAs are best used in joint venture. So you got to have the deal going back to the funder or the deal provider. You got to have a deal or you don't have anything. Correct. 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 Let's see what are the questions we have here. By the way, thank you guys for uh, watching. I appreciate it. I hope I get to meet some of you. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's a beautiful thing. We've got people from roughly 40 different States and 12 different countries joining us online here with us. So that's the one of the bonjour. great. Yeah, bonjour. I don't think we have anybody in France, but it's a, it's okay. Uh, so we, t- we talked about they use per- uh, trust. Uh, does Secretary of State Wyoming does not require to list owners of LLC of that state? Okay, Roy. The, the, the thing you got to realize about setting up an entity in Wyoming, yeah, it's cheap. It's like thirty bucks or something like that to start. In, but the thing is, if you ever get sued there, it's very hard to find attorneys enough attorneys there to help represent you, especially outside of Cheyenne. Okay. Just because something's cheap, you still want to make sure that there's attorneys there to help you out with. So yeah, I know a lot of people, oh, I'm going to have to start in Wyoming because it's really cheap there. Well, that, that can backfire on you in the long run. Now, I know that you're a fan also in Mississippi because it's pretty cheap to start an LLC though in Mississippi too, right, Walter? For the 30 bucks? Well, it's 50, 50, one-time fee. One-time fee. You're not paying annual fees on that, huh? Yeah. Let's see here. Question. Uh, thank you. Thank you. People are loving it. People, you should be getting your phone should be blown up with the uh, selfies. It looks like. <laughs> well, good. Let's keep them clean, folks. Keep them. Clean. <laughs> yeah. keep them clean. You should have said that in the front end. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Well, hey, Walter, I know that you've uh, got some things you got to run. You're getting ready to jump out and, and travel somewhere too before too long, aren't you? The next day or so. Like or tomorrow. No? Like tomorrow at five o'clock. I'm leaving. All right. Well, hey, bud. Thanks for joining us. We'll let you get rock and rolling here. Since we uh, any questions, unless there's any other final questions for you. Um, let's see here. John says he did put his shirt on before he sent you the selfie. That's very good. Awesome. Good stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for being here. We look forward to seeing you here next time we see you. And uh, your next, you talked about briefly the financial friends network guys. This is a huge, obviously you got to be invited to it. It's a great thing. We just went. We just got back from the cruise in January. Uh, had a great time out there. Um, looking forward to the next one. Excited to hear you got one going out in May of next year. So, well, we do more than that. But I'm talking about the educational trips. We're so what we do is, you know, the networking. There's dollars attached to that, and so we find that if we can get get somebody away for a while, that we can take our mind off working in our business to work on it that it pays big dividends. So last year, about this time, we took 100 people on a Rhine River cruise, 17 days, and they were all part of the network. And we're going in June uh, to a two-week island hopping trip in Greece. And then uh, we're going on a river cruise in Portugal right before Thanksgiving of this year. So we're already booked next year. So uh, we're going uh, now those two Portugal, there's still room on that one in November. There's not any room on Greece. So if you want to send me an email or a text, if you want to find out about it, but I'm going to tell you what we're doing next year. We have to plan these trips years in advance. So in May, we'll, we'll be going to Cuba and Honduras out of Miami, hopefully. And, um, but before that, Quincy's bucket list was to go meet him a, a leprechaun. And so we're going to Ireland during um, during St. Patty's Day. Nice. Uh, and we just booked yesterday, uh, we booked a small cruise in Croatia in September. Now people, well, where's Croatia? Just think Italy, move over. 
Yeah, it's to the right of Italy, definitely. And and some of the best beaches in the world there in Croatia, too. Very beautiful. We got our good buddy Val Satir from uh, Watermark Exchange loves to talk about the beaches in Croatia. So oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right, Walter. Well, hey, we're going to let you get out of here, get rock and roll, get you packed up. Thank you for joining us here on Note Camp 5.0. This is some great nuggets. Like I said, guys, check him out. There. There's his number. There's his email. Text him there. He'll send you the list of all those or the, the download of those videos on the trust, which is a lot of people looking for information. If you know how to use your IRA, if you know how to use your trust to keep more money, more profits, what you're making, it's important because trust me, you don't want to work too hard. You want to go cruising through life a little bit more like Mr. Walter Wolfer is doing. <laughs> I want you to come with us. Oh, uh, I've got, I tell you what, I have, uh, we've got some, we're headed to Hawaii in about two weeks and we're also taking a, uh, Spend three weeks in Europe, actually, in late May and June. We're taking a, a week-long Disney cruise out of Italy, and around Italy and Barcelona. That's fantastic. And then we're going to spend two weeks bouncing around uh, France and Spain and Italy as well. Probably we might or even look at taking a wine cruise down the river there in Italy there. Uh, well, the Portugal is a wine region. Yeah. The Douro River, if you look at Lisbon, go up to Porto. Mm -hmm. Port wine along the Douro River. Yeah, that's what we'll be doing. All right. Well, good stuff. Well, be safe. We'll talk to you later. All right, Walter? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, guys. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this session. Um, we will be back in the next section starting at, uh, we start at 3.30, I believe, is when we're back with George Antone from Finance, uh, the author of uh, The Banker's Code, um, let's see here what time. Yeah, he's exactly at 3.30. So you got roughly about an 18-minute break for you to get up, stretch, go get some coffee, and we'll see you back here at 3.30 Central Sharp. All right.